Oh, sorry, sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, 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 just a minute. Who are you? She said, my name is Mary. I said, Mary, where are you calling me from? She said, I'm in Denver. I said, Mary, how did you even find me? She said, well, I, I heard from a friend who called me and said you were coming to Billings. And I called all the hotels and motels. There's only three. <laughs> <laughs> this is very, really, very flattered that you bothered to track me down. Thank you very much. We enjoy your support. I'm glad you like Star Trek and the Spock character. I have to go. There's some people waiting for me. Live long and prosper. You know, I have to try. <laughs> <laughs> I finished packing. Four or five minutes later, I'm heading to the door, and the phone rang again. I did the same thing. I said, hold on, what another thing that was, oh, I got him, I got him, this, yeah, I got him, you can't believe this, it's so fantastic. Whoa, 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 who are you? She said, my name is Sally. Sally, where are you calling me from? She said, St. Louis. How did you find me, Sally? She said, my friend Mary called me from Denver. <laughs> and I'm thinking today, if Mary had been on Twitter, <laughs> I never would have got out alive. You know? <laughs> phone call to phone call to phone call. And that's, the technology has changed that much since then. But it like, did my mind just go there? Let's back up. Let's yeah. back up. Check up. Scotty, fix me up here, wouldn't you? <laughs> <clears throat> I was invited to go to, um, I became identified with science. The fact is, I, I flunked chemistry in high school. <laughs> I did. I flunked it. I couldn't do it. I was invited to go to uh, Caltech to meet with some students there who wanted to talk to me about their projects. So I went. And I'm, I'm interested in what people are talking about and what they're learning. And I'm interested, very interested in education. But as they were walking me through their labs and their projects, I was totally out of it. I couldn't, I just really could not track with what they were talking about. Just, uh, frankly, I can't track with what these guys are talking about. But I, I couldn't do it. I tried, I listened, I nodded sagely as they talked, and they talked, and they talked, and they just kept nodding. And finally they said to me, what do you think? And I said, you're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best I could do. That's the best I could do. I do know something about space travel. Um, I go way back with space travel, 19, 1950. I had been in Hollywood uh, just about a year and a half when I, when I was cast in a, in a film and I thought, boy, this is, this is terrific. I'm on a sound stage, I'm, I've got the costume, I've got the makeup, there's the camera crew and the sound crew, and we're, we're making a movie. I, I was so excited, I was 20 years old. And um, to this day, I can't imagine why this project didn't really take off and, and, and explore my career. It didn't, all it did was pay the rent for a couple of weeks. It was, a, it was a, a movie in which we came from space in a spaceship that wobbled across the screen. It was a cigar-shaped spaceship. We landed on Earth. Three or four of us got out of the spaceship. We stole a couple of Colt 35 revolvers and a pickup truck, and we're going to take over Earth. <laughs> The hero wore a metal helmet that he put on his head when it was time to fly, and he had a rocket pack on his back, and, and they had a little trampoline for him, and he would, that you couldn't see was outside the camera. He jumped on that trampoline, and he would leap up in the air, so when you saw this guy running towards the camera and leaping, and he'd disappear, go out of sight, when he went into space. When he was in space, traveling in space with this rocket pack, he had a, a dial on his belt, and the camera would cut to that, and you see that dial, and the dial, believe me, as I, I'm telling you the truth, the dial said, up and down. <laughs> <laughs> the project was called Zombies of the Stratosphere. <laughs> and I was one of the zombies. <laughs> so I know something about space travel. <laughs> I was there when, uh, when the Enterprise was rolled out uh, in Mojave. The Enterprise shuttle, the first shuttle that came out, and it was named after our, our Enterprise on Star Trek. And this was the shuttle that, uh, that was mounted on top of 747s. They flew it up in the air and then released it so they could practice landings with that, with that uh, ship. And uh, it was a thrilling day, it really was. When the day that was rolled out, when it came out of the, out of the hangar, the Air Force Band was playing the theme from Star Trek. 
very exciting to be there on that day. And there's a, there's a movie in the theaters now called Hugo. Maybe some of you have seen it. Uh, it's, a, it's a testament to the work of Georges Marier, a French filmmaker who was making films 100 years ago. And one of his movies was called, a, a, a major classic film was called A Trip to the Moon. And in it, you saw, they loaded this torpedo kind of thing into a big gun, fired it, and this thing takes off in space. And it lands in the, 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 the kind of a drawing of the face of a man in the moon. And, and this torpedo lands right in his eye. And, and uh, 67, 65, or 67 years after Marier came up with this crazy idea, Apollo 11 took place, and we landed people on the moon. So there really is a very, very direct connection between science fiction and the things that the science fiction writers dream about, and, and the fact that engineers, scientists, at some point are looking at this stuff and saying, I wonder if we could possibly do that. I wonder if it can be accomplished. In Star Trek, as you probably know, we had a, what was known as a transporter, which meant that you could stand on a, on a, uh, on a pad in the transporter room, Scott would throw a switch, you would disappear, you would appear someplace, a transporter. The reason that the transporter was created in Star Trek was because it was too expensive to show a spaceship landing. In the 60s, it cost a lot of money to do that special effect, it used to show landings and, landings and takeoffs. So, and this was a very cheap effect to do. It was, uh, it was just a, a dissolve from one piece of film to another with a little gold sprinkle over us. And it, it cost pennies to get the job done. So in, in that case, uh, inventiveness created, created science fiction. And, and, and now, I, I came across this, um, this story on, on Wikipedia about this information on Wikipedia about, about transporters. It says here, in 1993, the idea of teleportation moved out of the realm of science fiction and into the world of theoretical possibility. It was then that physicist Charles Bennett and a team of researchers at IBM confirmed that quantum teleportation was possible, but only if the original object being deported, teleported would destroy <laughs> I'd rather not go, thanks. <laughs> This revelation, first announced by Bennett at an annual meeting of the American Physical Society in March 1993, was followed by a report on his findings in March 29, 1993, issue of Physical Review Letters. And since that time, experiments using photons have proven that quantum teleportation is in fact possible. Now, I understand it would take a tremendous amount of energy to move a, a human being from one, or an object from one place to another. But somebody's thinking about it. Somebody's trying to figure out how to get it done, I'm sure. When I was asked to make Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, which became The Voyage Home, the story about the humpback whale, some of you may have seen it, um, I decided that I wanted to explore uh, what was happening in interstellar communication. And I went to visit Philip Morrison, who's an astrophysicist at MIT. Oh. I had a wonderful conversation with him. Did any of you from MIT, MIT background? No? Uh, it's a school in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> so I had heard that he was involved with the SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And I was very curious about this. They were, they were setting up listening devices that, that are still operating today in the hopes of picking up some intelligent signals from some other intelligent entity. And Philip Morrison was one of the scientists involved. So I went to talk to him to find out what was happening with the SETI program and his thoughts about uh, interplanetary communication and, and inter society communication. Um, there was a movie made called uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still. In that movie, an actor named Sam Jaffe portrayed a kind of a, uh, an Einstein kind of character. He was the leading scientist of the period. And uh, in his lab, he had a blackboard where there was a very elaborate equation put up in chalk. And at the end of the equation was simply a, an equal sign. So there was no resolution. It was blank. Like he couldn't, hadn't quite figured out how to resolve this equation. And when this character lands on Earth on another planet and steps out of his spaceship and comes to this lab, and he walks into this room and sees this equation, he picks up a piece of chalk and chalks in the result, the, the, the resolution of the equation. 
when Sam Jaffe, as the scientist, sees that, sees this result, he understands that he's in the presence of a superior intelligence. So he says to him, there are some questions I'd like to ask you. And the suggestion is that this person from this other planet who, who could make the trip to Earth and could resolve this question probably has answers to questions that scientists are grappling with at the time. So I said to Philip Morrison, if you were in the presence of a person like that, a superior intelligence from another planet, what questions would you ask? He got very angry with me in a very nice kind of way. He was a wonderful man. He, got very angry. he said, that's not the way it's going to work. He said, that's a science fiction idea that if somebody comes here or we get in touch with somebody from another, another civilization, that they will be like 100 years ahead of us on exactly the same track. So they'll have the cure for cancer, and they'll know how to do things faster and better, and they'll have the answer to the technological questions that we're struggling with. It's not going to work that way. So I said, well, how will it work? He said, if we do make contact, if we do get what seems to be a repetitive intention, intentional signal, it will be unlikely that we'll ever be able to even understand it, let alone carry on a conversation. They'll be thinking differently than we do. They'll be functioning differently than we do. They won't have the same issues that we have. You won't, have, you won't be able to have that kind of communication. That conversation led me to understand that there was something that I could introduce into Star Trek. So this was an interesting kind of reverse. This was science, a, a scientific answer to my question, leading me to an idea that I could introduce into a Star Trek movie. At the time, I was interested in the possibility are concerned about the possibility of the extinction of humpback whales. Humpback whales put out this very interesting song, and we call it whale song. They make these strange sounds. They're mysterious, they're beautiful, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're repeated from whale pack to whale pack around the world, and, and uh, we don't really know what it's about. We don't know whether it's territorial, or whether it's sexual, or what it is that these whales are communicating to each other. We don't understand it. It's been studied and discussed, but we don't know what it's about. So I concocted this idea that this alien civilization had been having a conversation with these whales through whale song, and it's not meant for human understanding. And this pearl has lost contact with the whales because the last whales have, have, been, have, have been killed off. The probe is coming to Earth to find out why it's lost communication, and it's tearing up the Earth's oceans in the process of searching for humpback whales. And we understand Spock and Kirk and the rest of us understand finally what's going on here, that they're trying to make communication. We decide we have to go back in time. So I'm telling you the story of Star Trek IV, which I hope some of you have seen. Um, yes. Go back in <laughs> Thank you. I feel a little bit more at home. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so we go back in time, we pick up a couple of humpback whales, fly them into the future, drop them into, into, the, uh, into the ocean, and they respond. To the, to the whale song that the, the probe is singing, and, uh, and Earth is safe, of course, naturally we have to save Earth. So these are some of, the, some of the things that I deal with in the world that I live in. Uh, I want to give you a couple of, uh, just another minute or two to, to tell you about a couple of things that inspire me or touch me as I, as I think about the work that I do. I have a, a piece of calligraphy on my wall that I refer to every day that talks about, uh, that deals with the life and experience of being in the arts, of being an artist. And what it says is, um, Edwin Booth, the actor, heard the solemn whisper of the god of all arts. He said, I shall give you hunger and pain and sleepless nights. Also, beauty and satisfaction known to few and glimpses of the heavenly life. None of these shall you have continually, and that they're coming and going, you shall not be foretold. This is, to me, a, a perfect description of what it's like to live a creative life, to, to be in, in, in the creative process. It's hunger, pain, sleepless nights, and, and moments of great satisfaction and thrilling glimpses of, of what there's somebody shooting up in the sky. Have I done anything wrong? Am I okay? Am I safe here? Yeah. Okay. Um, Arthur Clark, I'm going to close with this, and I'd like to have a little conversation with my friend Steve. Arthur Clark, if I can find it, 
famously said. Yeah. Brother Z. Clark, he wrote the, uh, the 2001 Space <laughs> Stop that! <laughs> the Space Odyssey that uh, Stanley Kubrick made in a movie some years ago, a landmark film. When a scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. How about that? Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>